Hi, my name is Peter. I'm an emergency medicine resident uh, from Denmark, currently working in Stockholm. Um, and um, this is a lecture I gave at a um, uh, at an event where I was give, giving a presentation to our uh, some our newer doctors, what you call in Sweden eight AC Lacker, or in Den Denmark Kovulea. It's kind of like an internal, almost internal level. Um, and uh, I was asked to talk about making good decisions in the ED. So this is this is this lecture. So um, everyone who didn't participate at the lecture can participate here and watch the lecture in its full length with more nuance and detail. All right. So um, here are some of the references that I um, for this topic um, would. Um, would recommend that you begin with if you're interested in emergency medicine and decision making there's lots and lots of other um, references and i've made um, a lot of <laughs> a lot of blogs a lot of podcasts and a few book chapters on this topic so um, if you're interested in more references or deeper dives then um, please go check out uh, check out uh, acutemedicinon.dk which is linked uh, down below here um, most of the concepts that I will be going through, uh, they will be referenced in this material. So uh, please check this out if you're interested. I, I, um, I have been so fortunate to be able to be um, part of um, Eric Driver's um, group uh, doing, um, being in the structure through um, almost eight years now in the Emergency Medicine Core Competences course, or Lund Cushion. And I recommend that if you haven't been at this course before, then, um, and if you're interested in, in emergency medicine and decision making and how to like make good decisions in the ED, then this is a must cor uh, have a course. Um, it's probably, um, and I'm biased, but this is probably the best course around for this specific topic. Okay. Um, I have made other um, videos on this. I almost always talk about this topic in different videos of, on different uh, topics. But for instance, this is a, a video where I've gone through a lot of the um, theory as well. So check that out. If, check it out if you want to. What we're going to talk about today is one of my favorite topics to talk about, and I think it's hugely important. But I always like to frame. Uh, frame it a bit so that we know where we're at. <laughs> so um, this like this huge group of like this umbrella term called non-technical skills is what I love in emergency medicine or one of the things I love. And um, I always think about it like this. So if you have a wall um, like a brick wall like this, then all of the technical skills that we learn, like the information that we gather from books about procedures, or we know how to do specific things, or we know how to treat atrial fibrillation and so on and so forth. That's a, that's like a brick, right? Well, that's good and all. Um, but bricks don't stand on their themselves. They need, um, this glue kind of thing in between here. And, um, this glue thing in this analogy is what I would call non-technical skills. So if you have good technical skills, they cannot stand alone. They need this glue. They need good non-technical skills for them to be able to work in the, in like in both in the emergency environment, but in general in the real world. Non-technical skills are sometimes also called crew resource management or human factors, or there's lots of name, soft skills sometimes as well. There's lots of names for this. Um, and some of the like big topics within this umbrella term is communication, teamwork, and leadership, and fellowship, and uh, followership, and situational awareness, and decision-making, task management, and performance under pressure, and deliberate, deliberate practice. And I've done videos, and I've done uh, blogs and podcasts on most of these topics, if not all. Um, and today, we're going to talk about the specific one called decision-making. Okay. So before we head into this topic and decision making, specifically in the emergency department, it's good to have a, like an overview of just what is emergency medicine, what is the topic, like what are the what's the purpose of emergency medicine, and 
is it as scott weingard has argued and some others uh, in this great podcast uh, this great smack talk has argued is it a failed paradigm like why do we exist and i think it's important to stand uh, like when we go into this lecture about decision making to think about why what is a good decision in the emergency department how do we measure that And it's the current paradigm of emergency medicine wrong. So before moving on, I urge you to, um, well, <laughs> you're not in groups right now, but in general, you could just take a few minutes to think about what is the purpose of emergency medicine, where you come from? And is it even important to have emergency medicine as a concept, or could these roles be filled in by other um, people or other specialities. Because, because I think it's hugely important for us as any kind of doctor to be able to self-destruct if we need to. If we're a burden on the, on the system, we need to be able to self-destruct so that we're not pulling the system down for our own selfish, selfish reasons uh, for, exi for existence. Um, and it's particularly in a new speciality like emergency medicine, um, we shouldn't be more confident in our in our own place in in the world that we that we should always um, second guess whether or not what we're doing is actually important for the patient, important for the system. I would argue that the so Ruben Strayer has done a great lecture on this. What is the purpose of emergency medicine? What are the, like, the main priorities? And I think for me, it boils down to these three things. At least like these are the more like big three things. Time and critical conditions is usually one of the core priorities in emergency medicine, right? We don't care if it's not a time critical condition. Kinda. There, 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 there are exceptions, and I will come to those. But in general, that's kind of the bread and butter, right? We, if the patient has a presentation like chest pain or abdominal pain or whatever, we want to rule out the, the like first and foremost, we want to treat or rule out the high risk, time critical conditions that is most likely within the data point set that or the symptoms that the patient is presenting for us, right? So that's one of the main things. That's why we are called an emergency department as well. Then we have to balance this out by saying like, okay, we we need to take care of the individual's time critical conditions, but we also need to take care of the everyone else in the emergency department's time critical conditions. And every time I every every minute I spend on one patient is a minute not spent on the on another patient. So there is this what you call zero sum game in emergency medicine, where um, I, I need to be aware that, uh, that the time that I'm using on one patient is not used on other patients. And there's this flow and access block problem where um, I need to keep up first, like I need to keep some amount of flow uh, and an overview over the department. Otherwise it will uh, crowd not, uh, or we will have crowding, not only because of what I'm doing, but um, a lot of um, outside of the emergency department factors is p participating in the crowding problem. It's just showing up in the emergency department because that's where people can go when everything else is access, access blocked or closed. But uh, we can at least help with this with the throughput of the problem, right? We can get people through and that's also like having flow is part of the um, uh, like and, and and managing the entirety of patients from a more utilitarian uh, perspective is really important as well and then i put this as well this is for every patient you see as a doctor not just an emergency physician we need to make the patient better as a product of, of us seeing them and not worse that's that's the central thesis of being a doctor, right? It doesn't mean that we have to fix their problem, but it it's kind of goes it, it, it 
we see a lot of conditions in emergency medicine that are not time critical. It's very much a needle in a haystack kind of situation where we try to find the one that actually does have a time critical condition and we, not, we, we try not to hurt the rest and maybe even help them a bit on the way when they don't have a time through time through critical condition and this we do through communication through some of the other non-technical skills that i i'm not going to talk about through this lecture but in in specifics but um that's that this is what i think the purpose is the sum of these or is what i think the purpose is for our emergency medicine or at least like maybe 90 percent of it but the, let's focus on when we're talking about decision making for the individual today. Let's focus on the time critical conditions for the individual. All right. So, which kind of population do we have? Well, so if we take, for instance, where I work in Stockholm, we can take let's take a severity of conditions that I see every day or through the ED. Right. So, if we take a country like Denmark or Norway, where we have a very strict gatekeeping. Um, uh, filter before people come into the ED. Well, that means that majority of the patients that we're going to see will be in the more severe part of the spectrum here. Um, but if there's no gatekeeping, like we kind of have uh, in most of the world on outside of Denmark and Norway, where people can just turn up in the ED without any permission, so to speak, then we don't have any filter. And then you can your abdominal pain that have, has gone on for weeks and weeks maybe or any problem that you as a patient see as a uh, well if you're above a threshold to seek medical attention and there's so, so much access block in the system that you cannot attend a, a appropriate level maybe a primary care physician within a um a, a, a timely hour or a timely like a, a decent amount of time then you have to go uh, like to the emergency department and, and then we then we like get diluted in the population that we see we get crowding and we get a lot of patients that we um, that we potentially because we need to keep up the flow will uh, potentially harm because they will get blood samples they will get a lot of tests done that otherwise would not have been necessary if they had gone to the emergency oh, sorry to a primary care physician um, who could uh, maybe look at them, see them uh, in a week's time, and take some basic blood samples if needed, uh, and use time as a test um, instead of doing like diagnostics right here and now and um, crowding the ED. This is not this is not the patient's fault. It's it's like the the system design's fault, and this is a complex problem with the crowding and 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 access block that is not covered uh, here. But that's just the situation, right? And even even more, we can get a dilution of the population that we see when we have even more access block. If we have a culture of like the system, don't we, we don't want to miss anything. So we like increase the sensitivity of any test that we're doing, uh, even like the te telephone consults um, and the gatekeeping where we like the gatekeepers don't really, they don't dare to miss anything. So they just send everything in. Then we'll have a very, very high um, amount of what we call in Stockholm the green ocean here, um, and this is uh, this is for anyone who's worked in at least in Stockholm or any other uh, probably bigger cities with an open system like this, you will see a lot of these. And the problem is in this ocean, some of these will be hiding. And these systems where we don't have that much gatekeeping, uh, one of the main purposes for the emergency uh, physician is to treat these find the needle in the haystack, right? But also not hurt these piece of people. Because there's a problem with, um, there's a problem with uh, this, like seeing people at the wrong level of care. It's called the Leon pr principle, right? If we, and, and we, every care should, like care should be follow, following the uh, Leon principle. And um, if, if you don't <laughs> follow that, then there's a high risk, especially in the emergency department, for harming patients with our tests. This is from Overdiagnosed by Gilbert Welsh, and I think it's a wonderful graph, um, where you have, um, let's say we have the C spectrum on, on the X axis, and on the Y axis we have like high or low, just um, so 
for the, for for this this one for any given treatment the benefits as this as the um, severity of a specific condition becomes more then the benefits of you treat being treated is better and the harms though that's kind of um this it's kind of stable there's argument to be made that it may be a bit wobbly this depending on the condition but in general it's kind of stable your your patient sorry your body doesn't care if you're giving uh, blood thinners for a severe condition or for a very not severe condition and at some point there's this infliction point where uh, the benefits outweigh um, sorry the harms outweigh the benefits and if we if we if we are on the wrong side of this graph on the left side of this and we're if we're on the left side of this inflection point or crossover point here then we are harming patients by our tests so we should always keep in our back of our mind this graph when we're doing emergency medicine and if patients are on the wrong side of this graph or we think we're doing tests that are beyond on the wrong side then we should inform them about the risks of doing more tests in general we should be using time as a test much more on on populations um, in the emergency department but it's hard right we need to keep up the flow and that's that's kind of the that's that's a complex condition that we work under and this is the situation in which we're making decisions So as we talked about, what we're trying to do is finding the needle in the haystack. So if we do, uh, if we do um, want to find this needle in the haystack, we do need to do some CT scans. We do need to do some tests oftentimes. And um, finding um, the patient just by doing, like, let's say you have a hit rate of 1 to 10. That's a good hit rate, right? Then that's a sensible hit rate for a lot of conditions, especially the rare ones. Um, but if we're too liberal with our tests, um, then we have this high risk of becoming a bad, like more problematic for the for the system than it actually helping. All right. So emergency medicine is finding the needle in the haystack without burning the hay or without causing problems for the 99 percent of the of the patients that do not need anything emergently. Um, and where we should probably be, be be better off just sending them home with a follow-up for as a with a time as a test. Um, so in emergency medicine, we care about the time critical conditions, and let's go into more details about um, what that means. So, in a lot of areas of medicine, we don't. Um, we care more about. Uh, they would care more about what is the specific condition uh, that the, that may be the cause of the patient's problems, right? So the symptoms for the uh, like the symptoms are is belly pain, and the patient wants to know what it is. But that's not our focus. We don't care what it is unless it's dangerous, right? We we care about whether or not there's a time critical condition. Under the, underneath that symptom presentation, that's like, or when we we may care if, we, if we're talking about the individual patient and getting them to the next step and so on and so forth. But in general, like if we cut it like uh, without any details, then then we only care about the time critical conditions. And when we see a patient, when we see a symptom presentation, I always like to, to think about this. Um, this two by two table that I've um, come up with. Um, so you have time critical conditions and not time critical conditions. And then you have through the, uh, uh, before you see the patient, there are some things that are more likely for is with chest pain, there are certain things that are time critically uh, and likely that we should think about. And as you gather more data, these may shift but you always have these time critical and likely uh, conditions uh, for the specific situation that we need to rule out or have thought about at least. And um, it's a good, like what you call a forcing strategy to think about these specific things uh, or diagnose, diagnoses as we go through the case. And especially before you send the patient home, have I ruled out the likely and time critical conditions? Uh, give me three um, time critical conditions that I should rule out. And 
uh, if you can do that, then then you're probably okay to send them home, right? So you should always consider these. These are the non-time critical conditions that is that are most likely, right? But um, these this, this may be for a chest pain patient. This, this may be musculoskeletal pain or unspecific viral uh, cause of chest pain, so forth, so forth, like so on and so forth. And that's this is all good and like this is usually what will go over with time as a test. But the problem here, uh, sorry, the 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 good thing here is that we can actually use this if we have one of these conditions that is highly like we have, we have a really good test to be sure that this is the condition that is that is uh, the cause of the symptoms then we can use that because if we can rule in this with a high certainty then we can usually rule out this because when the certainty of this goes up then the certainty of this goes down right or the likelihood of this goes down so we can rule this in and then rule this out and my common example is in DC patients. If you see a patient with, who has a, a very specific sign, like or the very specific signs or eye movements for BPPV with a, with a good history of that, then you can rule that in because it's a really good test. And then you can thereby you can rule the time critical and somewhat likely a stroke for dizziness out because you have, you have ruled this in with a high certainty but another example is if you if you use a chest pain patient and you say oh you, you palpate the chest and yeah, they don't have any chest pain uh, so sorry they, they they don't have any um they you, you palpate the chest and they are like a bit sore on the chest well that doesn't that's not a good enough test to rule out like most patients are at baseline a bit sore on the chest right that doesn't rule out the reason like the risk of the the, the like for instance acs um because that's not, not a, that's not a good enough test uh, right so you need these are really important to know about if there's a good test there's lots of other examples headaches and migraines except for example don't ever like don't ever think that it's only a migraine if you haven't like because it's not a very specific uh, test that we can do for those lots of mimics uh, in time critical conditions mimic migraines right so so um yeah and just the last one, if you do, if you give a gastric cocktail to someone with an epigastric pain, then it's not only like if only if if the chest pain goes away or the epigastrial pain goes away, that doesn't mean that there's no ACS because that's not a good test. It may have done so either way, either by the regression to the mean because the, the conditions go over by themselves, or because there's a placebo effect or whatever. Uh, it's not a specific test. Um, so this is just some examples of how and how to and how not to use um, like use this ruling in by ruling out then of course you have the non-time critical and unlikely conditions we don't think about those and then you have the sepras and the sepras or sepras uh, these are the conditions like if, if, like we may have had them we may have them in the back of our mind when we're thinking about the, the, this condition but they're not really likely and like um, it has to be, there has to be a lot of tests that that are uh, like not pointing towards these for us to actually consider these but zebras as a concept are not rare the specific zebra like the specific um, Bokova syndrome or esophageal rupture that is rare but seeing uh, any kind of zebra like for all the 200 and maybe 200 250 patients that go through goes through a our emergency department per day maybe only one of them has a zebra but it's the, the concept of us having a zebra it's not like it's only like one in 250 it's just the specific zebra it's it's it's, it's not that common right so it's common to see zebras but it's not the, the specific zebra is not common all right so so you may think like if you're thinking really systematically you may uh, say to yourself okay um i have this um for like there's a given amount of presentations in the emergency medicine like chest pain and dizziness and headache and so on and so forth and if i like map out all the time critical conditions before like these like which time critical conditions should i know about 
um, in emergency medicine for the specific um, presentations. And then you can like, get a map. And that is what um, Ruben Strayer has, has tried. So like this is a, like this sun is a, um, like all of the rays of this sun is a specific time critical condition that emergency medicine uh, providers should be aware of, right? And um, if you go further, then for each of these time critical conditions, you may gather the symptoms, right? What are the symptoms of the uh, and and the epidemiology and like all the important stuff, like which which tests are good, which test has a high sensitivity or specificity or a good likelihood ratio, as we'll come to and talk about. Um, and then, you, the, so so this is kind of a, like the map that we like an archive that we create in our mind, and that can be um, expanded through our career. And we call each of these each of these conditions illness scripts. So, um, so so for emergency physicians, we carry a an archive in our mind, um, benignly to us or unbeknowingly to us, um, and. For a given presentation, some of these pop up when we hear it, right? When we hear a patient telling or a story about maybe chest pain, there are some of them that pops up to our in our head, and this can be fairly standardized uh, sometimes. Uh, into for for chest pain, this would be maybe the big six: ACS, periomyocarditis, pneumothorax, pulmonary embolism, acute aortic syndrome, and an operate GI problem like pancreatitis or or gastric bleed or whatever. Yeah. So and and then then what happens when we are listening to the patient? We're we're using our communication skills to to do open questioning in the beginning in the beginning, making patients tell their story, and then through the story we'll pick up the data points that uh, light up right. So um, and that's that's like through this. Um, through this process, we'll be gathering, or we, we are waiting, weighing in which data points are important and which data points are not. Whether or not the presentation is chest pain, or maybe it was back pain. Like so, so everything is not set in stone to begin with, and that's why it's, it's important, like to begin listening to the patient, asking broad questions to begin with, unless it's really obvious, and most times it's not, even though we think it is. And avoid these cognitive biases of premature closing and so on. Okay, so through this process, then we'll uh, like um, then we'll then we'll get a picture, and then we'll have a few differential diagnoses that we'll move on with. And the ones that are time critical are the ones that we will want to rule out, right? Um, some of them can be um, can be ruled out just clinically through history. Or through basic tests, or through um, clinical decision rules, uh, or tools, um, but most of them, or some of them, may um, need uh, additional testing, right? And that's that's w w when this comes in our knowledge on the on the specific on the specific conditions and what kind of tests actually are good enough to rule them out. Especially sometimes you have a double whammy where you have a high risk for several conditions and you can just do one test, maybe a CC scan or an ECG or a POCUS, and then you can rule out all of them in, at once and then the patient can go home or go in if we cannot rule it out. An important point, point about this is when you're a novice or you're new in the emergency department, then the S-bar is <laughs> like, <laughs> show me your S-bar and I'll tell you what kind of uh, level you're at in emergency medicine. <laughs> so when anyone is consulting me as an emergency physician or asking me a question, I can listen to the history and we can usually hear through the way that you present the S-bar, whether or not you've thought about the likely and time critical conditions for the, for the condition that you're talking about. Because if you just are talking about an S-bar, if you're just presenting an S-bar as the patient said it, then that's that's like that's not you haven't you haven't thought about it then, and you haven't you haven't your the conditions that should be lighting up has not lit light lit up um, when you t spoke with the patient or you may have been leading the pa the, the patient to a specific condition. Uh, my usual example is um, for a patient with with a headache that came uh, came on. Uh, maybe a bit suddenly, then it's really easily uh, easy to just um, kind of manip manipulate or lead the patient to um, 
say yes to the questions of oh is this a um, um was it sudden and was it severe because if you ask specifically for a patient who has waited for a long time in the emergency department and who's who's scared and who's anxious and uh, is in pain then usually they will say yes more so than not if you ask them specific questions or leading questions so you should ask them these open questions um so um through the US bar, and this is also a point of Ruben Strauss, through the US bar, I can, you, we can tell how much you thought about the, the really important time critical conditions or not. Um, all right. Another point about gathering the data, because what we see, this is from Catherine Montgomery's book, How Doctors Think. Um, so if we have our illness script of ACS, we have this picture in our mind of how this looks at what what does illness scripts of acs look like well um we may you know in the beginning of our career uh we may think that well that is it's a male 50 years old smoking um and who has a um, gradual over minutes onset central chest pain that maybe radiates to to the left arm okay then through our career, through um, evidence-based medicine or reading studies or recent case studies and uh, being at morning meetings where we go through cases prospectively and, and like iteratively so, so we can learn from them or participating in one of our courses, for instance, and so on and so forth, then we gather um, experience, we gather uh, more knowledge about a typical illness script, and then we may know that, okay, ACS can also pre uh, present with atypical features such as um, shortness of breath or um, maybe um, even dizziness at rare times, especially if you're a, women, a woman at higher age or you have a neuro deficit or diabetes, then the typical becomes atypical or the atypical becomes typical, right? But no matter how big your, like, or how nuanced your illness script of um, a specific condition like ACS becomes, you always have to make it fit the condition that the patient is presenting with, and not like you don't you you shouldn't mash it up. You shouldn't try to lead the victim into one of these like decision or, or, or illness scripts. It should like you should thoughtfully um, ask the patient open questions to kind of see if they fit. And if they don't fit, then you just have to accept that they don't fit. And most times they don't fit perfectly. Maybe the chest pain wasn't radiating to like, maybe the chest pain was kind of more sudden onset. The patient describes it as more sudden onset, even though there's no, um, other features of this might have been an or session, but just because it was sudden onset, then maybe you're like either you, you you're carrying this uncertainty and saying well i mean through the way the patient was presenting this information i don't like he's anx anxious as well and so on i think there's so much so saying that this is acs that is so un it's so unlikely for this to be aortic dissection but you may um, also sometimes need to actually rule out that even though there's maybe on maybe only a, s a single feature that uh, steps in the on the, in the direction of aortic dissection you may need to rule that out before going into getting giving giving the patient a lot of blood thinners right um so but no matter what no matter the, like the, the the book example of a, pa a patient presentation is never um, the, the reality in the real world there will always be some um some things some parts of the history that doesn't overlap with what we think the average patient should present with. And that's what we call um, irreducible uncertainty. There will always be an irreducible uncertainty um, when we talk with patients and we try to fit them into these illness scripts. And that's okay. Um, I think um, it's uh, Arabella Simpkins, another doctor who's, who's, who's done uh, studies on this and uh, who has really readable articles on this, talks about this being something that we just have to accept this uncertainty we cannot we cannot change it it's a matter of fact right and we don't no matter how many tests we send there, there will not be enough tests to to actually rule this uh, like to, to reduce this uncertainty is irreducible okay yeah so um um 
what I think is important is what I find personally to like be more reassuring is um, to reduce this uncertainty is if I know I've gathered, gathered the data in a good way, take maybe just two or three minutes more with the patient to just sit down and listen and, and try to like like uh, summarize what they just said so we I know that they're on the same page that I haven't misunderstood anything and just taking their what they said as a straw man uh, argument not actually trying to like give back to what they, what they said and see if this that's correct um also like g- giving like uh, being a good data gatherer is is so important like how to communicate how to look for what you need to look for um and i've made videos on that if you if or if you're interested um for instance the headache video that i linked to in the beginning and then of course we have to share this um uh, we have to share this uncertainty with the patient as well, because we cannot make decisions on our own in emergency medicine. We, or in medicine in general, we need to share our decisions with the patient and say, well, this, these symptoms that you're presenting with, it's it's kind of, um, we have this, this, and this. We may think could be the case, or um, this is really important. This specific piece of information, I just need to be perfectly sure. Did you or did you not think this is uh, a really? Uh, why did you come in today? Is one of the other like what were you? Was it because it was worse, or it was because you just happened to um, be at uh, be near the emergency department? So sharing the decision making is so important in these situations of irreducible uncertainty and and seeing if the patient is all right with that uncertainty or seeing if we are all right with it or we we would recommend doing another test to just reduce some of the uncertainty but just knowing that they can never be reduced completely okay so this is some more broader thoughts about um like the time critical conditions in emergency medicine and how to make decisions around them um let's go a bit more specific into what we call probabilistics and specifically um we'll go through the we'll do it through the frame of a system one system two um way of thinking so this is the model of system one system two if you want to read about it in an emergency context and then look up patrick crosskery He's made books uh, really good with cases, um, but also articles and videos. And he's been on Smack. Check him out if you haven't already. Um, so in short, he's made this graph, which go, which um, builds on um, uh, Daniel Kahneman's uh, System One, System Two, or um, Thinking Fast and Slow, um, and. And there's there's other theories on this, right? I especially specifically like the naturalistically uh, naturalistic decision making uh, by Gary Klein. Um, so this is not the only model for this, but this is one of the more um, uh, thorough and and important models that are um, in, good to know about. And when you have what it says is, if you have an illness presentation, well, then we kind of have our puzzle where we don't know what it is, and we want to. Uh, so so and, and then we either we recognize what it is and then we go automatically into system two. Oh, i know what this is or we think we know what this is and uh, if we if we know what this is then we'll just um go through um and then um, come up with a conclusion and this is where there's a risk of bias um because um we either we think either we actually know what it is or we may think what we know what it is but we actually don't and if we if we would we like jump to conclusions too early sometimes it's um it's uh, we 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 may end up in the wrong direction too early right so we need to have this uh, policeman uh the rational override which is the system two process and the system two process is this um is this category of like that's this is laborious thinking this is energy um requiring it's um it's what we think about when we think about cases when we actually think about cases and what could be, could it be what c- couldn't it be weighing in the different um data points um, that's when we're going through system two processes and well i've made an entire video on on the, this I, I won't go into details about what it is and what it, um, like how to um, go through these, but just making a framework of of the um, 
um, on the system two. Here's the system two, and um, let's go through probabilistics um, for, because this is where uh, they belong in like laborious thinking <laughs> uh, in system two, and then we'll go through uh, system one afterwards. So this is Simon Carley, Professor Simon Carley in Emergency Medicine from Manchester. And um, he says, we are not diagnosticians, we are probabilisticians, right? In emergency medicine, we don't care about what the patient has for a diagnosis. We only care about ruling out dangerous stuff. And um, there's this great article by Schechter where he says, like, in a nutshell, this is what emergency medicine is. Patients do not have disease. They only have a probability of disease. And diagnostic, diagnostic tests, such as the D-dimer, are not, like, dichotomous. This It's not all rule in or rule out. It's not like if it's positive, then they have the disease, and if it's negative, they don't. It's merely adjusting probabilities up and down. So um, every test has a probability that um, um, that is... Um, uh, like we can we can find out through sensitivity and specificity from from studies, right? And it's spectrum, right? A D-dimer of one is not as dangerous as a D-dimer of fifteen, right? So there's like the tests also have like a spectrum, and they have a weight, um, and this is the weight as we'll see later. We call likelihood ratios, and the likelihood ratio is kind of a, a synthesis of the sensitivity and specificity, and um, um, so, so um, the, this, the patients don't have diseases; they only have like a probability of disease. And if we do one test, um, then we can adjust the probability depending on the weight of this test, depending on if it's a good test or not. We should always, in emergency medicine, fly ahead of the pain, uh, fly ahead of the plane, because test inter interpretation should precede test ordering. So, when when we kind of know already that, okay, I have this test and the likelihood of like the pre-test probability as we will come through, like before going into the test, the the, the, the chance of the patient having this uh, condition is maybe only two percent. Well, then if the test is positive and it's maybe a D timer, then then it won't do anything. And if it's negative, it won't do anything. Well, then I shouldn't take the D dimer. That's test that that's flying ahead of the plane. Or what if I what if I order this CT scan? Of the abdomen and it turns out to be negative i might have really good reasons for doing that but if it's positive then then you should, the positive tests usually direct um which way we have to go because it's easy to usually with a positive test say oh we have to admit that patient or there's a cholecystitis or there's an appendicitis that's kind of we we follow that pathway then um, um but if it's a negative test then what do we do do we send the patient home it's really important to think about these things before ordering them, and then you, then when the result comes up, then uh, then 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 it's easy to, to make the decision and already inform the patient maybe before doing it. Okay, like we're doing this test, I have a low low suspicion that this may be an appendicitis. If 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 the test is negative, then we can go home, all right? And and then you can have the discussion about the patient uh, whether or not that's a fair thing for the patient to do, and then maybe they want to go home before that as well. Oh, I don't need the test, and I'm not afraid of that. Okay, well then, you can go home. So, it's really important that concept, and from that it follows that from 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 these rules it follows that if you have a patient with a lower pre-test probability of any condition, then you really need a really really good test. Um, um, for even us to consider that condition, uh, like uh, for us to consider that if if you have a low pre probability and the test is positive, for instance, if you have a um, that, that's kind of like a screening test, so it's like kind of like if you have a um, nodule in your breast, and then or sorry, if, if you don't have any nodule in your breast and you just want to be screened for breast cancer, then then if the test is like even like the trivial diagnostic test of, of breast cancer is really really good it's have it has a high specificity and sensitivity but if you have a low pre-test probability then even a good test you may only have a after the test is positive you may only have a 10 percent post-test probability that you have cancer even though you have a really good test so the test always um is uh, is context um 
uh, context sensitive, right? You need to know the context. You need to know the pretest probability to interpret a test. If you have high pretest probability, for instance, that may be a patient with a sudden chest pain that radiates to the back, and uh, you may, the patient maybe even may have a Marfan syndrome and have a different blood pressure in both arms, and and um, then 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 you someone has drawn a D dimer and says, oh, but the D dimer D dimer is negative. Even though, like, if I think you will agree that the patient has a higher risk or higher pretest probability of aortic dissection, but if the D dimer is negative, then even though it's a good test, then that may go from a pretest probability of 80% to maybe only a pretest probability of 10%. But 10%, I don't want to miss 10% of, uh, like, I don't want to miss 1 in 10 aortic dissections right that's that's a, it's too dangerous a condition to miss um to have a one in ten risk so you need made even though the test is good then it doesn't rule out and if it doesn't rule out then we've already flown ahead of the plane i don't need to do the d-dimer i'll just go go ahead and do the cc scan right away there's one more important topic on co concept here that is really important we don't care about the outcomes. Of course, we care about the outcomes of whether or not the patient died or all of these things. We, we do care, but from a decision-making standpoint, I don't care whether the diagnosis was pulmonary embolism or it was aortic dissection. I care how you found out about it. Why did you Why did you make the decision you did? On which grounds, which data points made you do that? Because otherwise you're just lucky. Right. If you don't know why you did it, and you don't know which data points were the reason for it, you're just lucky. Or you may be, or you may be an expert. Um, and we're in the system one mode where you can just like gestalt it. But um, usually, you need to be able to like explain afterwards when you're going through the case which data points were important and which were you weighing in. Right. Um, because remember. Most patients with a serious presentation don't have any dangerous conditions. For instance, thunderclap headache, 10 to 20% maybe have a dangerous condition, um, but that means that 80% don't. So, if you a, a good decision for a thunderclap headache, like a true thunderclap headache, would be to make it do a CT scan within six hours, right? And maybe, maybe not a lumbar puncture, depending on. Um, but that would be a good decision, right? A bad decision would be making, like, or from a diagnostic standpoint, a bad decision would be sending that patient home with thunderclap headache. But the patient has a one in five chance of having a good outcome anyway, and most patients would would have a good outcome, right? So even so even though the patient had a good outcome, it doesn't mean that uh, your 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 thought process was right, and. If you reapply that next time, you you will make mistakes, right? So it's important to um, reflect on our own thought process, and that's usually mainly done through case, um, like prospective case, uh, like uh, going through cases with your colleagues. Like I have this patient, I had this and this symptoms, these and these symptoms. Um, then this happened. What would you, what would you do? And then give a bit more uh, information. Then I get this. Then I, then you get this EGD. What would you do? And then, then you can see like, like how people think instead of giving everything, the entire case up to begin with, or giving the outcome. Oh, this was a pulmonary embolism. This is a really exciting case. Let me let me go through what what happens. Like, I don't care whether it was a pulmonary embolism. Tell me what made you diagnose it, and what data points you you what what which data points made you trigger, um, made made you do the CT scan, right? Because oftentimes you've missed something. Oh, you found a, you found the pulmonary embolism that was not important, but you missed the underlying um, the underlying abdominal problem that was actually the problem for the patient, and, and then they died. All right, so uh, so uh, yeah, that's really important. We don't care about that much outcomes. We care about the processes, right? And when you make mistakes, think about the processes to begin with, not the outcome. All right. 
there's a lot of important concept that comes from this as well. So let's go back to our two by two table here. Um, let's see. Well, let's see. All right. Let's go. With, and, and and if we, we if we make a graph um, about this, then we can kind of. Um, if you this is the red one, so if we if we have this is a hundred percent likelihood. All right. So you have if we have the like the time critical conditions and likely conditions on down here, they are mm, somewhat likely, right? They they're almost always less likely than the non-time critical conditions, um, at least to begin with. Before we get get the patient to get, like gather data on the patients, just knowing that the patient presents with chest pain, for instance, then in this one there's like aortic dissection, ACS, pulmonary embolism, and so on. So the big six, right? And here you have, like most patients have benign, benign conditions, even though we don't know what it is, as long as it's below a certain threshold. Uh, the time critical conditions are below a certain threshold, then we don't care. Then we can go, then you can go home, All right? Um, and this is 100%, right? So if if I ask a question where this these conditions go up, then these conditions must go down. Um, so in emergency medicine, we don't want to find the most likely diagnosis. That's not important for us, or that's it's not usually important. And it's important to communicate this with the patient. That the, the, the reason why they're here is to reduce the risk of anything dangerous. We may in the process find out what it is, but that's not the purpose. We hope we can help you, but it's not, not necessarily in a way that you think that we can help you. We don't fix your problem necessarily if it's not a time critical condition. That's important to expectation management with the patient, right? What we want to do is we want to like find the crit time critical diagnosis and then rule out these. Um, and if we cannot, uh, we need to, to, to work it off. Like, uh, yeah. And if we cannot find anything, we, we need to uh, work it off. Like, and we have to react on the data we have right now. We are, uh, we cannot like, Oh, um, Tomorrow we had much more data. Um, well, it's too bad. <laughs> That's not how we work, right? We, we, we need to, like, at the time point where we see the patients, we need to gather the, the, the most amount of data at the bedside, the most highest quality amount of data that is needed to make the decision, right? And what that amount is, it differs from patient to patient. Let's, let's just do a quick example here. So if we have a 50-year-old year old with chest pain, then you have someone... Um, so we don't know anything else about the patient. Then we know like precess probability from epidemiological studies that 10% of the patients presenting to the, to the ED in Sweden will have an ACS, right? A much lower percentage will have a dissection and PE would be maybe two or 5% depending on what kind of PE you're thinking about. The smaller or the larger ones, right? The rest will be musculoskeletal or something else. Right, but if we if we begin to ask a question because this is the sum of this is a hundred percent, and that's we 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 think this is a hundred percent, or we we say that this is a hundred percent, and it is if there's only one condition being the cause of the patient's problem, but if there are more than one, like Hickson Stixson, the patient can have as many damn conditions that they want. Um, especially in the elderly, that's the problem where you might have several conditions for the same problem, then. Then this this thing falls apart. But it's a good assumption to to say that well, it's usually only one condition. So if you ask the question like now you want to gather a new data point, the pain is worse with inspiration. Okay, well then uh, then that's pleuritic chest pain, right? If the pain is worse with inspiration, so then the PE goes up, and because the PE goes up, then it's a bit more atypical with ACS. It's very much much more atypical with dissection. And the other ones, it may be pleuritis or something like that, or it might be musculoskeletal as well. Okay, so that, this is like through the entire process of the data collection, and um, like these things go up and down uh, through throughout the entire um, time. And how much they go up and go down, that's depending on the likelihood ratio, right? And the way we gather the data, the like, um, for instance, did I ask specifically, do you have pleuritic chest pain? 
um, yes, no, then if they say yes, then, then maybe it moves a bit. But if they specifically said, like, if I if I ask a spontaneous, sorry, if I make them tell their story and they say, oh, I, I, I my chest hurts, especially when I'm breathing in, then that's a spontaneous, spontaneous data point, and that's a very high quality, as opposed to the specific, more leading questions. All right. Just an example, if we have someone with a clinical suspicion of a DVT and a well score of four, then you have a high likelihood of pretest probability, right? So this is where it might, may be a good idea to do a D-dimer. So the first test is negative, D-dimer is negative. Then what happens is our post-test probability becomes our pretest probability for the next test. And that means that our ultrasound is negative. Well, then our, then our um, post-test probability for the next test goes down and you can like add the two tests and then you're done right one of the central models that i uh, have been alluding to is called kashira's threshold model um and kashira's threshold model is kind of this model where we have um we have a diagnostic threshold and we have or a test threshold and we have a treatment threshold so when we're gathering our data, at some point we may get over the test threshold. And at this point, it's better for the patient to get a specific test to get either rule out or rule in. That might be a CC scan, it might be a D-dimer. Um, but if they're below this point, then it's then it's not too good to, for them to have um, this test because it will hurt them more than gain, like or they will, there's a higher risk of overdiagnosis of, of false positives. Um, and it will hurt them more than uh, do good for them. Um, how much, and, and of course, if, if you're over the treatment threshold, then you just, then you just treat, right? Or then you just yeah, go, go directly to the treatment. What, like how much, uh, which amount of, of information need, you need to gather to actually be able to do this? Um, it, like, can you just go to a patient and say, oh, I, I just ask you one question and then, then you can, that, that's not enough data, but how much data is enough is very specific, like is, is, is individually uh, determined and it's not really um, anything you can predetermine in my opinion. It depends on the patient and the condition and the, like the pre-risk factors and the, like the way they describe their symptoms and so on. At some point though, you will say, oh, I have gathered enough data, I've, I've done a thorough exam and, uh, and for the specific for the condition uh, for, for the condition uh, a specific exam right uh, not um, and then and then then when you have um, gathered data in a good way then 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 you will be comfortable with yourself saying like I've, I've actually I've sat down I heard the patient's story I didn't find anything dangerous um, and I'm content with the fact that I've done a thorough uh, for, uh, evaluation, they can go home. And it depends on the patient, right? What determines the test and the treatment threshold is, in short, three things. How bad is the disease? How bad is or good is the test? And how bad or good is the treatment? So if you have a really, really bad disease, like aerodialization or subarachnoid hemorrhage, then you have a much lower threshold to actually work it up because there's such a high mortality or morbidity with it. Especially if you have a really good test, like the CT scan within six hours is a really good test. And if you have a good treatment, so you do have a good treatment for subarachnoid hemorrhage, that is coiling. So that's this perfect example of where we have a low threshold, right? The opposite of that would be a condition where um, there's not a high mortality with it, right um or morbidity whether it. it's not real it's maybe a like a light time critical condition it may be uh yeah and then 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 uh, you don't have a really good test for it either um or the test is really expensive or bad in some way or um, you may and you may even not even have a treatment for it even if you do diagnose it you may think of a specific example. I can uh, right now. I, I I can't, but there's lots of examples out there for this. So that's the threshold model, and that's something we use along with the probabilistic thinking. So the probabilistic thinking, in a nutshell, is what we call Bayesian theory. It it consists of like you have a pretest probability, and then you time like 
connect that with the weight of the test. Um, and we te like the weight that the test can be either measured in sensitivity and specificity, but that's kind of hard to use clinically. So we usually calculate the likelihood ratio through sensitivity and specificity. You can do that through get the diagnosis, for instance, where they can calculate it for you. But it's directly um, like it, it, there's no added on. It's sensitivity and specificity and then just a few calculations. And what you get is a likelihood ratio. If you, if you have a positive likelihood ratio, that means that if the patient, if, if, this is, if the test is positive, then the, 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 then the pre-test probability is in, uh, like the likelihood of the patient having a condition increases by the amount that the likelihood ratio um, uh, like the weight of the test, how good the test it was. So if you have a positive likelihood ratio, that's when the test is positive, or negative likelihood ratio, that's when the test is negative, then it goes down, right? And the weight of the test, some tests may have a likelihood ratio of, well, if you, plus 2, plus 5, plus 10, and it e roughly equals to a 15 increase in, in if you had five percent before then now it's 20 percent if that's positive it was five percent before then it was then now it's 35 and so on um and you, you call this the tennis rules because um 15 30 and 40 45 <laughs> kind of that's um how you score in tennis right so and that that's the uh, steps that a likelihood ratio of two five and ten um will increase your risk or increase your likelihood of that condition being true and um, a specific condition may have different weights on the positive and or will always have different weights on the positive and negative sides it's very rare that we have a test that or oh, if it's positive then it's that is really really good and if it's negative then it's really really good uh, that might be some certain CC scans for certain conditions but but um, in general, like for the D-dimer, the D-dimer is, if that's positive, then it's out here, maybe even out here where it's really minor, maybe 5 or 10%, depending on how much positive it is, of course. But if, it's, if we just go by the dichotomous, like positive or negative, then it's out here. If it's negative, though, then it's out over here, right? So a negative test we can use very much, a positive test not so much. All of this boils down to what we call the FAG and SNORMOGRAM. This is the pretest probability. This is the test and positive likelihood ratio, negative likelihood ratio. And this is the post-test probability after the test. So you can draw lines through this. And if we have, like, let's say we have a D-dimer for um, acute aortic dissection, that's a test, right? And it has a likelihood ratio of minus uh, 0 0.05 if it's negative. Um, and a positive likelihood ratio of um, 2.1 if it's positive. Um, then we just need to decide what the pre-assess probability is. And I'm not saying we, we, we shouldn't go around calculating these things, but we kind of have a rough estimate through our archive or database of uh, illness scripts in our mind. Um, how much... Um, how, much how, how likely is this from a population perspective before seeing the patient? How likely is it? And that this data we can gather from population studies in the ED. Um, and then when we gather data, then we get much more data through our archive, um, uh, what we know about aortic dissection. Oh, I know that, like, um, especially the history, if, if there's a sudden chest pain or it may have been radiating or there may be um, some kind of neuro deficit, like, like uh, chest pain plus one, as we say. Then, then the likelihood ratio goes up. But that's bef but before going into the data um, gathering, then we have a pretest, like the pre pretest probability. And for your dissection, it's one in a hundred thousand in a population. But our population is actually in the ED. So let's say maybe it's one in ten thousand, maybe like that, maybe one in five thousand. It's at least really like down here. It's really rare before seeing the patient. But then we know, okay, if the patient has some kind of information, then then we then we then we get up and up and up in precess probability. That's that's how we like kind of think of this. But we shouldn't. It's the concept more than the math because the math is kind of rough. But so it's more like the concept that we need to know about. So let's say our precess probability is maybe one percent before seeing the patient. 
if we screen everyone coming through the door of the ED with a D-dimer, then, I mean, we would have a lot of, as we do some places in Denmark, then, well, from 1% uh, to, like, it doesn't really do much. Uh, like, we're still really, really low risk to begin with. It doesn't help us much. But the test, this is where we, like, why do we take the test as, at all? But as, as the, as the, Precess probability increases. Maybe they say like, "Well, oh, I, I had it. It wasn't really that kind of chest pain, but radius to my back, it's kind of severe." Then maybe it, your 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 precess probability goes up as you gather data, and then oh, I was I'm also I also had Marfan's, and the blood pressure was different in both arms, so the D-dimer suddenly becomes really important, um, or it may be important, right? Um, what you can see here is that. The test, the D-dimer, it's independent of, like, it really, it always, it always depends on the precess variability, um, whether or not. So, so if you if, let's say like someone comes to you and, and they say, oh, um, I had this patient with chest pain, the D-dimer is negative, kind of send them home. <laughs> well, it depends, and it, like it's the same with ECGs or D CC scans or whatever, whatever test you're saying, give me the context first. Because then I can assess the previous probability, because a D dimer as negative in in a pre high previous probability condition. Well, maybe even the, the, the even though the D dimer may be negative, then there's still a maybe a five percent chance of this being that. And through the threshold model, if we apply that, well, it's above a threshold still, right? It's above at least a test threshold. It's, it's somewhere in between, uh, I'm sorry I made these blocks wrong, but it's somewhere maybe in between, like we, we're not ready to treat yet, we haven't diagnosed anything at all yet, but we're not ready to rule out either. So we're in between uh, the test threshold, which is be up here maybe, and then the treatment, or the, that, the test threshold and the treatment threshold. So even though the D-dimer is negative, I still need to do a, a new scan, right? And at this point, if the precess probability was so high, then I shouldn't have done the D timer. I should have done the CC scan right away because it doesn't. This doesn't change my decision. If it was positive, didn't change my decision. If it was negative, didn't change my decision. Right. All right. This gets us to a concept called acceptable miss rate. So let's say that we through the Fagans normogram, it becomes quite obvious that there's also there's always a post-test probability. So how many how many acute coronary syndromes do you want to miss? One in ten, one in a hundred, one in a thousand. Most would say zero, and that's not a good answer because that's impossible. Probabilistically, it's impossible to not miss an, an ACS because, or any other condition, right? What we're talking about is not there's there will never be a zero percent chance down here, as just as much as there will be a hundred percent chance that this is the condition. There will always be, uh, in the ED at least, uh, from a probabilistic perspective, there will always be. Um, a non-zero chance of this being the condition that we're trying to rule out and we and the concept of acceptable miss rate is how much do we need to work up someone to be able to actually say it's ruled out and we can send you home for pe dr klein has um, done some calculations and say it's around two percent below two percent then the risk of doing more tests are, is harmful to the patients, more than beneficial. Depending on the patient, and depending on which, which risk they weigh the highest, of course. But yeah, that's your decision making for you. Um, for and if you if you so so you will miss one in fifty um, um, PEs when you're using the well score, um, and that's just how it is. 
so so that's what we call about talk about acceptable misread but we think about it that's actually often necessary to have some kind of boundary where we rule out another i've had this discussion in denmark several times and for for patients with a um, thunderclap headache where we do ct scans within six hours in sweden you re- yet that's rule out if you do it with a good ct scan and a more experienced radiologist reading the scan then it should be ruled out but in denmark we don't think of it like that and in denmark we think of it in terms of ct scan and then lumbar puncture no matter what and that's kind of strange to me um or at least I understand because it's it's a really difficult condition uh, and and we may not always have experienced radiologists and so on but but if the conditions are right then from a probabilistic standpoint it doesn't make sense to do CT scan and then lumbar punctures when the when the process probability is so low right because there will always be an acceptable miss rate and during the lumbar puncture which is harmful for the patient may not be worth it and there's been studies on this i think it's the lumbar puncture rate should be one in 500 or, or close to that so so it's so so the the concept of acceptable misbury is important so that brings us to so when we send someone when we send a patient home it's like we may have anxiety oh they will just go home and die they don't they almost never do right if you send someone home with the time as a test, even though you're kind of, oh, maybe we should do more tests, maybe not, and talk with the patient, see if they are comfortable with it, and send, send them home. Most of the patients that we send home will never come back because most of the conditions in the ED are not dangerous. They will, they will regress to the mean, and then, we'll, and then, then it will go over especially in in systems where we have no filter before and where we see the green patients right then there, there might be some of the ones that send home that they actually did have the diagnosis they did have the um epiglottitis that we that that was the tonsil like the the, the tonsillitis did actually was the epiglottitis but it was important to find out in at the point when we sent them home right For, with the data points that we had it was good diagnostic like good way to do um good it was a good decision um then you have the patients that don't reach the ed for not they, they didn't they didn't come in in time uh, when we sent them home well that's that's a very very small amount all right and then the ones that had so bad consequences that they like they they they, they were the ones that died in their sleep or right died on their way and these are ex- exceedingly rare all right so when we send someone home, we always like we shouldn't be too afraid if we've done a good workup. We shouldn't be too afraid to send them home. Just get them the plan and say, well, you can always return if it gets worse. We're here, and I know you don't want to co- come back if you don't need to. But with the data we have acquired right now, I think it's the wisest decision to um, make like get a bit more time on the condition and see if it doesn't go over by itself and if it doesn't then come in you're always welcome okay diagnostic error in the ed is according to error driver a failure to approximate the probabilities of time sensitive conditions based on the available point of care data information so we if we the data that we have in front of us for, through a, like blood gases, ECGs, data like communication with the patient and data gathering and point of care ultrasound and so on, if uh, if we don't through all these tests actually gather the data that we need, or we don't interpret the data that we do have in front of us, that's when it's an error because oh you didn't know that. Uh, either you didn't gather or you didn't know that um, a patient with a, a headache that is sudden and severe should have a CT scan within six hours or you didn't know that the CT scan w- beyond six hours was not sensitive enough to rule it out um, and so on and so forth. So, so, so if, uh, it's not about making errors or, or, or having a bad outcome. It's about the process. 
and it's about um, what data that we weigh in and, uh, or, and what we know about the data, right? And we shouldn't know everything about everything, right? But but it's about the process and knowing what kind of what we weigh in and what we, what we which data points that we weighed to to do this evaluation. Because in hindsight, we may always like, oh, you should have sacked when you sh should have you should have sacked when we um, when when you actually sacked, right? That's this is from Sidney Decker, and he has great YouTube videos on on er errors and and failure culture and so on and so forth. I highly recommend those, and I made there several blogs on this as well. But this this is a great picture from one of his books on hindsight bias, right? And so um, the doctor is here and uh, and. There's, when we make decisions, oh, oh I, I shouldn't go this way because, oh, the patient has hypertension. I, I'd rather um, treat them like this. And then, okay, that's good. And 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 and, and then then when we went on, and, oh, I, I'll have to do this. Then, and then this accident happened, right? But from someone looking on the, on the department of why did you treat this patient with this specific treatment? Well... <laughs> it's easy to to see he should just he's just just have gone the other way because over here that wouldn't have led to the accident right but you would only know that in hindsight we should always gather data from prospectively and see okay you get this data what do you do oh I, I don't change choose this i don't choose this but maybe someone else a non-expert would actually have chosen the wrong decision much before so we should always think about things prospectively, not retrospectively, if we want to understand the, the reason why our front, we we as front runners make the decision, decision that we do. Okay. Data gathering and seeing what others don't. So when we're gathering data, this is from uh, Nate Silver, the signal of the noise, some of his lectures. And in general, um, his concept is um, the more data we gather, um, we often think that, oh, we should just get get more data, more data, more data, because the more data we have, the, the better decisions that we can make. That's not the case, um, because the, the more data we get, the more uh, there's usually a higher risk of noise to signal to true signal when we gather too much data too early on or too, without just like with sh like shot gutting. Like if, we, if we shotgun all the information that we need, just get all the tests, get all the CT scans, then we then we get too much noise and li too little true signal oftentimes. So we need to be wise about how to gather the data. We need to sit down with the patient, do open-ended questioning, and then not do every test, but do specific tests, unless they're really sick. Unless we don't have time for that. And we almost always have time for that. But sometimes we don't have it. And we'll talk about that later on. But more data, just getting all the data is not necessarily better knowledge. We need to we need to think about which data points are important, which data points should count as data points, and how to gather these in a way so that we don't lead the victim, but we actually listen to the story, go back to our archives, see which things fit and which things don't. And then we shouldn't be bothered whether that someone ordered a positive D-dimer if we have never wanted to go down that road through uh, our assessment. This is Gary Klein, one of the um, great like cognitive psychologists on decision making, and I highly recommend his books and his podcasts um, with E.M. Crit, for instance. Um, but he says he in, in Street Lights and Shadows, when we assemble a puzzle, we have... Uh, with, uh, we have uh, we've seen the box cover and know that we're trying to what we're trying to create. The job is much difficult, much more difficult if we mix five puzzles together and don't see the cover picture for any of the boxes. This met the metaphor of connecting the dots and assembling the puzzle don't do justice to the need um, to notice and identify cues in the first place. You don't connect the dots that you don't or are not able to see. And what he's saying here is. Um, when we're seeing a patient, sometimes it's just, oh, you should, like we may say afterwards, oh, you should just connect the, dot, the dots. They present it with chest pain, of course, you just took, take an ECG and so on and so forth. But we know, anyone who's been in the clinics knows that patients don't necessarily say that they have 
it's not obvious what they have, right? So you need to like, and sometimes if it's chest pain, well, sometimes it is, but sometimes it's really noisy data, right? It, it, it's underneath this, oh, I also have belly pain and then I came in and then I fell as well. So I'm, I also hit my head and like, like lots of data points. Which data point is important here? That's not always like which pieces of the puzzles are actually the puzzle that I want to find out what is and which should I leave behind? This is really like seeing what others don't, which which data point should I find? It's not just connecting the dots, it's finding, finding out what counts as a dot. All right. I've talked about how to how to gather information uh, through history taking in a good way. You can read this yourself, but I and I've made like check out my headache video where I go through this in in details. I've also made a compassionate care uh, podcast where I both podcast and video where I go through this. So in general, you can check out that, and um, I'll skip this slide. So what makes the decisions in ED easier? Well, reduce faulty knowledge. We need to know. Like we need to know stuff. We need to gather this archive in our heads. We need to know, oh, patients with flank pain can actually have abdominal aortic aneurysms. That's really like really common um, and commonly missed, right? So you do need to do that CT scan if, it's, if they're older and haven't had kidney stones. We need to get that knowledge as emergency physicians, right? And that's kind of what's scary because we never, like what we call unknown unknowns, we don't know what we don't know. But we know that, like, we need to we need to get to where we know that we don't know a lot of things, but we're comfortable with it in a way that, well, and we can, and then we, and then we always, we shouldn't be too scared to ask colleagues if we, if we haven't seen something before, right? We're not experts at any, at, as every, at everything. All right, so we need to read. And we need to gather like information about our the illness scripts that we need to be able to diagnose in the AD. Then we need to reduce faulty data gathering, information processing, right? So that's through non-technical skills. We need to know about cognitive biases. I won't go through these in, in this lecture, but um, we need to know like about or oh, premature closuring or the yeah. But we also need to like know that it's important to premature closure sometimes. We need to like gather data, do something if the time is short. So there's a balance, right? And we need to know about probabilistic patient thinking because things are on a spectrum always. It's not dich dichotomous. This is like 101 emergency medicine. And then communication, we need to know about that. How to not, how to not lead the victim, how to actually expect uh, do expectation management because then like it's how to dance with the patient, so to speak and get the data that we need, not too much, not too little, and then tie it all up with a nice bow tie um, where we have gathered the alliance with the patient or gotten the alliance with the patient and can just um, treat them uh, in a good way and understand why they need to be treated uh, or why they came in and what they're afraid of. Again, I've made videos on this earlier, just go through those. Um, and then we have to practice. We have to practice through prospective case read-throughs. Um, we have to practice through sim labs, uh, visualization exercises. Um, like these are my three three greatest um, ways of de deliberative practicing the things that I need to practice to become a good emergency physician. And then we need to like have a culture where we can actually ask about uh, like do we, we can talk about the mistakes and also the the good things, right? And we do, um, and not be blamed by it. Um, and then we need to, like, yeah, also performance under pressure, like, uh, and all the other non technical skills, right? All right, that was system two. Let's go through system one and prior one patients. <clears throat> so, system one, like, if if the maybe, maybe not sick patients outside of the, um, resuscitation bay are mostly a system two kind of game then the um the the, the trauma room or the uh, resuscitation bay patients are more a system one kind of game and the reason why is 
we don't have uh, if it's a true resuscitation bait patient if it's a true really sick patient then we don't have time to gather um to think we need to act now and we need to gather the data that we need right now and then we need to treat because if we wait to treat the problem before actually uh, getting the uh, if we don't want to treat before having the diagnosis at uh, hand then we're not going to actually um, make the patient survive because they will die before um, <laughs> before we know there's this metaphor that Eric Driver often uses about the Buddha and the poisoned arrows story and the story goes like this so someone is out riding their horse and they are getting shot by an archer and the archer runs away they don't get to see who the archer is and then the one the people who sees this and come to help the um the one the the rider getting shot um he they they they, they want to pull out the arrow but the rider tells them i don't want to pull out the arrow before i know who shot me and that's kind of uh, the problem is that the, well the the uh, the arch so the the um the rider will die if you don't pull out the uh, the needle from the or the the arrow now and they and then it will bleed to death right so that's the metaphor here um, it doesn't matter what the cause is when the patient is dead we need to treat before then on the data points that we have, we have gathered and the problem the thing is here when we have an imperfect data set then we need to treat and treat with a like a bolus kind of we don't treat small things we treat it bigly um, with, like with oomph we need to treat with oomph so we know that we either get a really great result or a really really bad result so we know which direction to take next because if we get a good result oh then it's then it then it's probably a good uh, then we it's probably what we the hypothesis that we the hypothesis that we had was probably right and we'll go through uh, and 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 do some more, and then if it goes the wrong right way, then it's probably the right one, right? And we but but if it goes the wrong way, it, like we we gave the patient a fluid bolus and their their blood pressure went down or it didn't come become better, then then there's something wrong with our hypothesis. We need to reiterate or gather more data or understand the data better, right? Um, in my uh, the, the bleeding trauma patient uh, didn't get better from from blood oh maybe it was a tamponade after all after all and maybe there's a neurogenic shock in this as well so we all that this is this is how we go through the um, the process uh, in the emergency department uh, resource bay um, Scott Weingart has this great lecture about OODA, OODA loops OODA OODA loops and bread baking where it goes through this and and there's this great new homepage that I found about by Sarah Krager a emergency medicine professor at UCLA under Jerome Hoffman um, and 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 she's she, she's done this great uh, homepage called ICU edu uh, dot com or maybe dot org I can't remember but um, she she goes through this excellently as well so if you want to know more about that then check out those resources in general when we're doing a resource bay patient there you can you can kind of like in a nutshell say that we we have we 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 have two processes going on in parallel we have the uh, empiric kind of treat as you go gather data if you have a low blood pressure then we give you fluids if you have a low saturation then we give you oxygen and we don't think about too much about the underlying condition or the syndrome but then par in parallel to that we are gathering data we are kind of connecting the dots or trying to see which dots or counts as dots right which puzzle pieces counts as puzzle pieces in this six puzzle uh, puzzles mix up and see which pieces belongs to our puzzle uh, puzzle right and once we're doing that we don't need that, that many puzzle pieces to be able to treat our low blood pressure blood low blood pressure patient specifically right so let's um so so um yeah, if you want to know more about these you can check out these but uh, for instance if you have a patient um, 
who has a, a seizure, right? Oh, uh, you start the clock. That's the, kind of the empirical treatment. You uh, Swedish go start the clock, do your A, B, C, and E's. Um, and for these, you'll give them benzodiazepines and then some kind of second line treatment and then propofol. That's kind of generic. But then on the ABCD syndrome, kind of, you, you take the blood gas and you do the CT scan and you do the history and, and, and the background. And oh, maybe they have preeclampsia, then you give them magnesium. That's a specific syndrome uh, treatment. Or they might be hyperglycemic, then you'll give them thiamine and, and, and uh, glucose, right? And so on and so forth. So, um, we may also look at it like this. So, um, and I'm using stars here because um, each data point may be is like a star, and we're kind of connecting star um, stars in the sky to make pictures, right? So, for instance, you have a patient with strider, redness, uh, or his red or all over his body, and low blood pressure. Oh, well, this patient we want uh, maybe. It's a syndrome of uh, in the context of shock. We would call we would call this shock. Well, this may be anaphylaxis, right? So at this point, with these data points, they'll just right ahead, go ahead, right away, treat with something that is low risk, like adrenaline IM or IV, um, especially IV if they have a, if you want to want it to work within a few minutes, which is often the time, then give uh, IV adrenaline. I have a video on how to give this and which conditions that might be helpful for. But then you might get another data point, right? Like you, you go through the data point again. It's like this iterative um, process, right? A diagnostic process. And then as we just showed in the slide before, and then, oh, they also have a fever. Hmm. That might be part of the anaphylaxis, but they may also have sepsis. Am I below a threshold of treating them, with, uh, uh, treating them with something that is a good treatment and a low risk treatment like antibiotics? Well, no, I will treat them with antibiotics. Oh, but they also have Khaleesi. Um, they, they also had, sorry, they also had Clostridium uh, uh, um really um, like a few days ago. Hmm, maybe I shouldn't treat them like then the my threshold goes a bit down again to so this is kind of the process that we go through all the time in emergency medicine and in, in resource pain. And as a rule of thumb, when you're at in the emergency room or a resource bay, then it's better to do than not to. Even even though more data may come later on, you can always like as long as it's not a, a treatment that is um like it's like where you have to think a lot is when you when you have treatments that can is irreversible like thrombolytics for instance um but antibiotics giving them a single dose of that that's not dangerous um as long as you just do cultures before then no one will get mad at you before uh, like uh, then you can just oh it wasn't that then i'll just then i don't have to do, use it anymore oh the fever was actually due to polyembolism doesn't matter if they got a, got a single dose, so so we we're trying to cover all the ground that is dangerous, right? And try to um, weigh out the benefits and risks, and do it in this iterative process where we do one thing, see if it helps. If it doesn't help, then we gather more data or trying to interpret our interpret our data in another way, and then do another thing to see if that, how that helps, right? This is a adaptive system where we. We throw something at it and see if it helps, and then if not, then then go back to the drawing board, right? Yeah, and that means that sometimes what happens in the ED is sometimes frowned upon, frowned upon at the at, at afterwards uh, on the department level, because ah, oh, it's obvious why didn't they do this or why didn't they do that? Well, the data wasn't there at the beginning where we where we are. Right, so the probability of errors in the beginning is really high, even higher at the primary care <laughs> level, right? And we should think about that when we frown on the primary care doctor sometimes, right? We should we should be we should be good to each other and know that decisions are hard in the beginning of a or of a series of of event, events, and it's always easier to, uh, afterwards to know, right? So yeah, that's the 
iterative hypothesis testing model, right? All right, let's just go through some cases. And using, using some of these models that we have we just gone through, so so kind of trying to manifest them. All right, so this is a 59-year-old woman who comes in with chest pain, and you get this from triage A, is stable, no trauma, respiratory frequency of 14, SATs of 96, heart frequency of 50, blood pressure of 124, and alert and and the temperature is 37.2. Okay, so right now we don't know whether or not we're going to the recess bay or not. We, you, you decide, right? You see, maybe, let's say, like for this to be realistic, you may see tens of these, like or at least a couple of these a, a day, depending on where you are in the emergency department. If you're in triage, you see tens or tens of the, or, or or hundreds of these during a day, right? You only have so many resources. You only have so many doctors that can take the. You take the resource bay patients, right? You only have so many resource bays and nurses and so on and so forth. So this is a zero sum game. Is this one of those today? That is like, of course, some patients just sometimes you just have to send all the patients to the resource bay if they if they come in a string of a string right away right after each other. But most times it's a it's a um, zero sum game where you have to weigh in wh which one which one. Um, do I have to send them now, or can I wait? Which resources do I have, right? That's a constant thing when you're in triage to kind of outweigh, like weigh your resources. All right, so this patient can is this going and um, is this going to resource re, uh, the resource bay right away? Well, not from the vitals, right? It sounds she, she's stable, right? Chest pain always something that well we need an ECG quite quickly to see whether or not something's going on. We need a bit more information, right? Um, so that's what we, we're gathering through the triage here. And we may think already now, like, okay, which six, like which conditions are the time critical ones before going in? Well, the ones that I have vaguely in the back of my mind of the six that I talked about, ACS, um, um, pericarditis, like myocarditis or pericarditis, uh, PE, um, pneumothorax, aortic dissection, and upper GI things, right? Um, but not, not uh, using like <laughs> here in the beginning. I'm I'm having really really broad uh, perspective on on things because I want to ask them a broad question. What brought them to the ED? Why did you come today and not? Some more like not yesterday or whatever, um, because if they came in just to just because and someone asked them, do you have chest? like if they went to their primary care physician and they said, oh I I have chest pain sometimes um, at, at the year at, at the uh, at the control each year, and then they like then it's highly likely that it's just a random day. And they didn't seek by themselves. They were sent in by their primary care physician on a day where they were screened for for something. All right. Um, but if they come in by themselves and then they actually wanted to come in and they don't usually come in at all, but today is really something else, then, then I'm more worried, right? So we need more information here. Um, all right, so... In the background of this patient, we have this the medication that they get. Uh, she had a myocardial infarction um, with a PCI a couple of years ago. Um, she has she has atrial fibrillation and a gastric bypass and COPD and depression and so on and so forth. This is a lot of diseases for a 59 year old. I'm I'm wondering are there any addictions or she's not taking good care of herself. Uh, before or she, has she just been unlucky but most times all of these things don't just yeah come along by themselves so um, do any of these data points change our um, precess probability of, on the condition as well she have had she has had a heart, heart attack before so the ACS goes up a little bit how much it's it's kind of in it's kind of vague, right? And risk factors only like there's this great lecture by Simon Carley called "Do risk factors factor?" And that's well, do they factor? Maybe yes or no. 
they don't factor as much as we think always. They may factor in certain conditions, but in ACS at least, they don't factor too much. Um, at least not in the, uh, like the older you are, age becomes a, the real risk factor. But the younger you are, if you're a 20 year old with diabetes and smoking and all, like then, then yes, then it may really very much mean something, right? Then it's a higher risk. You also have a type B dissection that, that does, like depending if it's a screening test or was something that was discovered through a symptomatic test, then then it's a higher or lower risk. But aortic dissection is something that is usually so high signal that even when the screening test is something that is probably a significant risk factor. So some of the conditions goes up. All right. So like what now we just one more step just for the few data points here. Conditions like pulmonary, pulmonary embolism, if we ever thought that, um, is going down because you're still on eliquis, right? Um, heart like heart attack or cardiac like ACS is going up because she had it. Uh, she had, she's had it before. Um, and from what I'm seeing, she's not on any, um, oh, sorry, she's on illiquis, yeah. Um, or aortic dissection, that goes up because she did, she actually does have one um, from before, but it's, a, a, it's not a symptomatic one, so not as much as if it is, if it was a symptomatic one, but still some. Serious gastric bypass, so the upper GI stuff goes up as well is it just we need to know what kind of like is it chest pain really is it actually is it, is it actually a gastric pain and then it might it be gastric bypass internal herniation or something like that yeah and then COPD well pneumothorax goes a bit up uh, they do get that and so on All right so I'll just picked out a few of them but that's kind of the process which data points makes your risk go up or down and how much uh, like there we don't have studies on everything about this so this is where the art of being a doctor or emergency physician comes in and also how you ask the questions right and like getting through these like was were you screened or were you not screened if you're not if you weren't screened then like if if something comes up through screening tests, then it's usually lower risk, right? Then you do your OPQRST history, and this is not the way you ask the patient. You you ask open open ended questions, and uh, to begin with, why do you come in, and, and then then they will um, then you will fit in all the, the fill in the blanks that they don't tell you, right? So this specific patient had three episodes of. Uh, chest pain, uh, the onset was um, uh, sudden, within seconds, uh, it was NRS 10, uh, and there was three episodes in three distinct, like within six hours, there were three episodes. The first, and, the, and what kind of position were the first and the third episode was localized um, mid-sternally, um, with the radiation to the, to the chin and the jaw, and the second episode was um, on the uh, uh, behind, like also mid -cent centrally, but also um, uh, towards the arms, like radiation to the arms. Um, it's kind of a um, it's kind of like a pulling sensation. She says at the quality, um, she's not nothing makes it worse or better. Uh, the pain is NRS ten. Um, uh, the the temp the temporality of it it's like 20 minutes the first one and then 30 minutes and then uh, 40 minutes um, and the, the, some of the episodes the first and the third episodes uh, is something new but the second episode the one where there there was radiation to the, the arms feels like her heart attack earlier on so this is a high risk history if you add, if if ever right if she says these things spontaneously then it's really really high risk. Um, and again, we can like which data points goes to which one, but I think we can agree that the sudden chest pain, like sudden chest pain is such a high likelihood risk thing. If they say that, uh, and it was NRS to begin with, like it's the subarachnoid of the chest, right? That's the aortic dissection. 
Um, so lots of things here that, that 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 tells us that this may be an oral dissection. There are still some things that will like it could be still be easily be an ACS, especially some of the like the uh, like the way like some patients tell their story like this is sudden it, it may be an ACS it may it may be the subgroup of ACS called um, scats like spontaneous coronary artery dissection that do present like with sudden chest pain instead of this classically anginal chest pain but so so we're <laughs> what do we do now is there any so so we should do bedside tests right but is there any amount of bedside tests that are going to change our management of this patient right so of course we do it but in the back of our mind we already now know that well even if i do take blood blood pressures in both arms and even if i do take that d dimer or even if i do do whatever it doesn't matter we we this patient is already good to go for a ct scan because you're, you you must do the CT scan, right? Unless, like, so let's say you see an ECG where the ECG shows ST elevation. Well, um, acute aortic dissection usually doesn't have that specific ECG changes. They usually have non-specific ECG changes, but they can have some features of um, ST elevation and depression, but it's just more rare. Um, um, but also maybe maybe you maybe you don't have a CT scan right away, right? Maybe maybe it's easier to just uh, um, maybe you don't have a CT scan for hours and hours. So then it becomes a difficult decision, like a, a more difficult one, right? So and and uh, if you're uh, and. Uh, then, then you may want to like what you and the problem here is that ACS and a and 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 or session they're totally different treatments right um, ACS is blood thinners and the other one is very much not blood thinners it's uh, anti like it's anti hypersensitives and 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 going in with surgery so we want to make be more sure before giving them blood thinners right um so already at this point, I, we've, there's no amount of data points, I think, from this point on that doesn't lead us to a CC scan, if your CC scan is readily, 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 readily available. All right. So, and I'm just showing this through the Fagans normogram, right? Um, so the CC scan, let's say this patient may have a 40-50% chance of having an AES. So if, um, if, if it's positive, then it's just positive. If it's negative, then it's negative. And every other test, well, if let's say the blood pressure things are positive and everything else, like if we just, then uh, I, as a, that likelihood ratio would probably not be that high. I cannot rule it in with blood pressure measurement or anything like that. And I cannot rule it out either with any measure, like with any tests that I can do bedside. The only test that is in for us now is the CC scan, right? So that this is like the point of I'm trying to make. So we do just do the, the some like we need to <laughs> we do do this either for the patient's sake because of the alliance or we do it like really quickly for, for just to to write that we have done it. But as emergency physicians, we know that it's not going to be important because it is not going to change anything. That we might even get the venous blood gas. I don't care. It doesn't matter at this point. And this EKG, I mean, yeah, there are some unspecific changes. There's no ST elevation, really. This, like, there's no specific things that says that I can I can rule out AAS before going for the ACS diagnosis. So no, we're moving on. And we did do the CC scan here, and this is the old scan. Hmm. And, oh, sorry, uh, I think one of them is, the, uh, this might be the old scan and this new scan where you do see this around. All right, next case here. Uh, 75 year old man with a flank pain. Um, so here again, we have a, um, uh, we don't know whether we should. You're the triage doctor. Should we 
go to resource bay right now or shouldn't we so flank pain um blood pressure like this heart rate like this doesn't look that bad does it right everyone in the emergency department has a high blood pressure right because they're uh, scared they are in pain or something right so um we don't get worried about this uh, so we need more information background well diabetes uh four heart attacks um appendectomy and hypertension otherwise healthy Woke uh, okay, so we need more information, right? Woke up at 1:30 p.m. Uh, a.m. with left flank pain that uh, radiated to the left side of the belly. Uh, it's hard to describe for him. Uh, there is no nothing that makes it worse. It's just really severe pain. If this is a stoic patient, this is when you're going to shit your pants because oh, why are you coming in now? You shouldn't coming during the night time and, and and now you're here uh, and uh, yeah, and they just say it's pain. That's that's usually severe. Um, but it went off went over after a couple of hours. The patient then fell asleep. When the, the the pain began again, all right. I never had anything like this. No features on no nothing 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 else on the on the history. So severe sudden pain, woke up from it. Uh, that then it went back and then it, like so there's a bit of a colicky nature to this. So what do you think? Before like what are we thinking? What what kind of test do we want to do? Well, we'll just we'll just throw in this. Um, uh, we do um, these tests here. It, it, in short, uh, the abdomen, abdomen test is probably the one that is important. And he's a bit he's a bit tender in the left um, in the left flank. Otherwise, uh, so it looks good. So, which differential diagnosis do we think here? Sudden flank pain on the left side in the 75 year old man who's never had anything before. Well. So one of the more, like we, we always wanted to think about the time critical conditions, right? So sudden pain is always, in an older patient, is always like mesenteric ischemia or um, uh, with flank pain and sudden pain, aortic, aortic, aortic abdominal aneurysm comes to mind. Uh, kidney stones, of course, but that's not, uh, yeah, that's more the... Um, that's more in the uh, likely, but not as time critical necessarily. It might be a little bit time critical depending on the creatinine and the infection counts and so on. But yeah, that's definitely something we want to call, call, uh, catch. Could it be diverticulitis? Well, it could be. Um, is it dangerous? Well, only if it's perforated, right? Um, but I don't think at this point we're kind of like, is there any test that is going to make us not do a CT scan on this patient? Because most places, if, if we think it's a kidney stone, then we don't do it. And if this colicky pain, it, it this is featureless. Maybe, maybe your, maybe your, 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 your doctor, um, maybe you just think, oh well, maybe if the urine dipstick is positive for blood, then then probably we can just go on and, and call it a kidney stone, and send the patient home. But so and yeah, the, the, there is actually blood in the kidney stone. Uh, there is actually actually blood, but but uh, and this ECG is unchanged. Um, but try to fly ahead in the plane of the plane here. What's the pretest probability already for these more difficult or time critical conditions? Are we over our treatment threshold or not, or diagnostic threshold or not, for uh, abdominal aortic aneurysm? Yes, we are, I would say. And this is where the knowledge comes in. Flank pain, especially when you, like, when you become older than maybe 50 or 55, especially if you have a heart condition history, then all the, all the bad stuff with the, with the uh, vessels uh, becomes higher risk, like, uh, like, like um, um, abdominal aortic aneurysm, like mesenteric ischemia. So I would, personally, I would just do the scan with the um, um, with the um, con uh, arterial contrast, and then 
we may not get the optimal pictures for diverticulitis and we may give the patient a bit more radiation if it was just a kidney stone, but at least we'll catch these. What you may think of doing in certain places is doing just a CT scan and you can, th can think of, well, okay, well, if you have a kidney stone on the right, on, on the, on the, on the left side then, on the non-contrast CT, would you go ahead and do the arterial CT anyway? The, um, uh, let me ask in a different way. Does the finding of a kidney stone rule out the more serious conditions? Are we below a threshold? Does it rule that out? Or can this patient have, has, have concomitant diseases? Like how many patients have kidney stones and this? And, and mesenteric ischemia. That's probably unlikely. If it's on the right, on the, on the correct side, and it looks like it, a lot of people do have some kidney stones, right? But um, so 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 it's, it depends. I don't know this. Or I don't know the data on the baseline of kidney stones in in patients asymptomatic kidney stones. But there's probably not like maybe a couple of percent that do actually have them. At least from my experience. So th this is the kind of the tougher decisions in the emergency department. Do we? And the easy thing here is like it's low risk to do the CC scan uh, with contrast. Um, so we might just do it. And then we get the information that we need, and then then we can rule out or rule in the more dangerous stuff before sending them home. Yeah, the, these these tests don't matter at all <laughs> at this point. Yeah, and we what we could do is an ultrasound, and then the interesting thing becomes well, we are doing the CT scan no matter what. What does the ultrasound change? Well. If you do do an ultrasound, oftentimes we should think of it not as a rule out test, but a rule in test. And especially in the emergency department, if we do in the surgical emergency department, if I do find a positive sign, like a small, small barrel obstruction sign, or if I do find this um, as an abdominal aortic aneurysm, then it tells me that, okay, this CT scan needs to be done emergently or urgently, not not maybe within the next hour or so that I, that might be the plan to begin with, right? So it may, it may decrease the waiting time for me and the patient and thereby decreasing mortality. But we need, it's a tool, right? It's not, we need to use ultrasound as any other test um, wisely. Because flying ahead of a plane, I don't need to do the ultrasound here. But if I can buy me an hour and, and call the radiologist and say, I have an aortic aneurysm, I need to go to the CT scan now. This goes for, uh, forward in the queue. Then that's something that is helpful, right? And this test takes a few seconds, right? <laughs> So, so that's what, how we want to think in the emergency medicine, probabilistically through thresholds and um, getting a bit of data, seeing which data points that we need to weigh in uh, or weigh and, and kind of having sometimes from studies, sometimes from experience and sometimes just kind of gut feeling what we should weigh in, uh, or weigh the most. And it's hard to through these cases because in the real reality, like here I'm giving you all the data points and saying which data points are probably the right ones and the wrong ones. But in the reality, you don't know. And you have to gather the data yourself. You have to ask the questions, right? So here we're only practicing like a kind of an idealized version of this. It's important to, to, to practice this, but it's only like I've pre-selected all the data. Actually, we should have... Um, 10, 70, 5 year old, some with kidney stones, some without kidney stones, some with risk factors, some without risk factors, because that's what we're going to see in triage. Which ones should have the CT scan? <laughs> and which data points are you weighing in? And why are you doing the CT scans on some and not on others? Are you consequent? Um, all right. This patient turned out to have a... Um, an aortic, uh, abdominal aortic aneurysm, as you, you can see here with a false lumen. Yeah. All right, last one. 
32 year old woman presents to the ED because of headache and you get this information. All right, looks normal. Um, headache is one of my favorite presentations I've, I've done. Um, <laughs> I've done Euro for a while and I love uh, um, emergency medicine Euro. Um, but headaches can also be really hard because there's a lot of conditions where mm, the CT scan is not really your best friend always. It, 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 specific CT scans are good for specific things, but it doesn't rule out everything. And sometimes you need more advanced images. Most of what you get is from history, right? And here it doesn't tell me much. This patient could have a subarachnoid, could not. Depends really on the details. Okay, so a bit about the background. She is obese, has is pregnant in week 33, and has diabetes type 2. Hmm. Otherwise, she's all right. Well, the pregnancy, while not, like a lot of patients have headaches during pregnancy, and headache in pregnancy is a topic of its own, but it doesn't, it, it definitely does open up some other differential diagnoses for us. Um, so far, we may all, already just in our minds, like there's no predetermined time at which we do this like stop and think thing, but already we can like do our two by two table and say, oh God, all right, pregnant patient headache, what kind of diagnosis do I want to think about here ruling out? Well, the, the likely and difficult, like the hard, likely and, and dangerous ones are at least preeclampsia. That's an easy rule out with blood blood pressure and urinary dipstick. Um, I have uh, um, CVST, like sinus, central sinus venous thrombosis. Um, that's a bit harder. That takes a um, scan, and we, but we, we will do that scan if we need to. It's the radiation amount is is negligible to the to the um, to the fetus, so that's definitely something we will do. Um, and always, all pregnancy patients can always also have other things like, or like all vascular conditions like um, dissections are um, more common in pregnancy because of the estrogen. Um, so, uh, like if it's a neck pain, uh, then uh, car, car, uh, coronary artery dissection or vertebral artery dissection is on the list as well. Um, yeah, so um, we need more details, right? So the headache had a gradual um, onset a week ago. Um, it was not a sudden, so um, seemed, depending on how we gathered this information, of course, we but we will rely on it um, as is. Uh, so it doesn't seem like subarachnoids are off the list, right? If it's not sudden um, and it's gradual and it seems like an NRS of eight. It's diffuse, doesn't tell us that much. It doesn't radiate, doesn't tell us that much. Um, what we want to know is it does have features, right? Um, or is it featureless? So are there any photo photophobia? Mm, no, not really. Is there any fever? Is it constant or gradual? Well, and what, what makes it worse? Is it worse during the morning? Mm. Mm, is it the worst lying down or not? Seems like... Yeah, a gradual onset through the course of days. I mean, the problem with, so if we look at our two by two tables again, then it's like CVST. Well, yes and no. So the risk is that she's in week 33 and depends on who she is. She's never had a headaches before. It's, it doesn't seem like it. And then we might ask about like, previous DVTs or pulmonary embolisms uh, in, pre in previous pregnancies, if she has been pregnant before, hereditary conditions, and so on and so forth. But um, really, I mean, at this point, <laughs> depending on, like, there's a lot of gestalt in this as well, but um, when we're looking at this patient, and if she's never been here before, she, she this, this developed out of nowhere, uh, she's tried with other painkillers, but doesn't help. And we can find another condition that rules the more dangerous CVST out. Well, then maybe we have to scan her uh, on, on this. It depends, but, but maybe. Um, 
Okay, so um, what about the others? Well, preeclampsia. Well, it, maybe we can rule that in and then not do the scan. That's easy as well. Um, and for the dissection, well, it doesn't look, it seems like head pain or neck pain. I mean, it doesn't seem like this dissection kind of um, history. Um, and then you can ask, like, okay, it doesn't seem like, what is your illness script of the dissection? Well, the illness script of the dissection is like this. Um, my archive illness script of dissection is like this. It's usually quite sudden in onset, but it can be, like, it's not usually not intense, intense, but it's usually quite, uh, quite sudden in onset. Um, it can be traumatic sometimes, but it often, often during pregnancy as well or in postpartum. It's um, usually, it, it may occur with uh, neurological symptoms afterwards, a couple of hours after the debut, uh, the, the onset of a headache or neck pain. It's usually a neck pain, not a headache, right? Um, it may present in 50% with a Horner syndrome for anterior and I think it's 25 with a posterior, like a vertebral. So, so yeah, so that's kind of, like, it doesn't really fit this bill that much, and it's a quite rare condition to begin with, so um, I would probably rule that out on on what is being given to me right now. Um, and if, we, if you remember the Catherine Montgomery ACS uh, illness script overlap with the reality, it may, I mean, I, I would, for me, it would be, under the the, tre the threshold of, of, of uh, working it up, but it may like it depends, right? You can only get so much from a story on the paper. So I think we're at this point just doing. We will consider this okay if we do get a urinary dipstick that's positive, and we do get a. Um, positive for protein, and we do get a blood pressure that is above 140 or 150. Does that rule in preeclampsia, and does that mean that she just does not have sinus venous thrombosis? Yes, I would say it does. Um, I would probably say it does. Um, if she's not had hypertension before, and proteinuria is significant then yes i would say but if it's like this is another thing way of, of like getting cases to become even more interesting and like what if questions so what if um what if uh, the proteinuria is only plus one and the blood pressure is 140 exactly or what if she's had um, gestational hypertension before as well does that mean yeah so these are the like games that you can kind of play, like adjusting the factors, adjusting your pretest probabilities, and what would you do in these situations. This is where you truly learn how to do these cases and what to do, and discuss it with your friends, someone who's knowledgeable about this, these conditions, right? All right, but we'll do the urinary dipstick here. Of course, we'll do an exam, of course, at first, but if the if they don't, if she doesn't have any like vocal signs, then there's nothing that we are going to do about it. Um, we may look for more preeclampsia signs, like does she have clonus? Does she have epigastral pain or liver pain? Uh, we may take blood samples, like help blood samples, and and, and so on. All right, so we get the urinary dipstick um, on plus two protein. We did get the blood pressure in the beginning is 142. Hmm. So we are in this condition where it's kind of borderline. Do the blood samples change anything? Well, hmm. maybe, maybe not. I mean, if she has the full blown help, then yes, it does. But probably she won't. Um, so we're in this condition where, well, it is like is this cons it is consistent with preeclampsia, but is it enough consistent for us to not do the CT scan? That's kind of the question here. And at this point, at this point, you'll probably try to do something to like 
change this. You may call the gynecology who may have more experience with the specific conditions than you have. Um, and if they can try to treat the preeclampsia during maybe just a day, see if the symptoms goes away, well, then maybe that's enough to not do the scan. But you may also say, argue like, well, the scan is not that dangerous. And if the scan is negative, then we do know that this is the reason, like this is much more likely to be the reason why she has these symptoms. So this is kind of, yeah, these are the, like weighing in different factors, right? Weighing in, weighing in different factors in a probabilistic way. Um, and as it turned out, this patient, they decided that this patient ha had um, preeclampsia. And well, again, I don't care <laughs> that much about that outcome because what I what I care about is a process. So sometimes, okay, we decided that she had preeclampsia. Um, if she, if it didn't develop any further, then maybe she had did have that. That's that's the golden. Maybe that was the golden standard. Maybe she had it, but and as that's probably quite likely. But but which data points made you say that she had it and? May, a lot of the C, a lot of the sinus venous thrombosis, they may go into themselves, right? They they may not give any further symptoms. But I, I'm just saying, I'm just saying, like maybe not specifically for this kind of condition, but other conditions. Why? Why was the outcome like the outcome is not necessarily important as we talked about. It's the process. Why did you do the, these tests? On which ground did you do it? And like if you tested something on a low precess probability and you had a positive test, then it's much more likely to be an overdiagnosis or a um, false positive oftentimes than it is to be the true positive diagnosis. And something that actually would hurt the patient. So, so yeah, that's why I'm going into these with this. All right. So this is a, just a two hour quick run through about diagnostics. I hope you Find it helpful, found it helpful, and um, I'll see you again some other time. Thank you.